Last time we had talked about activated diffusion bonding. Basically, I define it as just a way to take a difficult to bond interface. If you've got something that's hard to hard to bond to, whether we're talking diffusion bonding or soldering or brazing um, or or whatever, um, there's certain things that have very stable oxides, typically aluminum or magnesium, and I mentioned hafnium, uh, this this thing that you want to use for an electrode. And one of the things you can do is you can uh, put something else on the surface, so now you're bonding to a different type of surface. You're soldering to this, a different surface, or you're soldering to, uh, uh, or you're brazing, or, or diffusion bonding to it. And typical types of things that you like to put on are things like nickel, silver, and tin. One of the reasons these things come up is because they can all be electroplated. Nickel is probably the easiest metal to electroplate. In fact, there's uh, an electroless nickel that you basically, it's basically just a nickel phosphate bath, um, and you dip the, the metal in the bath, and the, there will be an exchange reaction, and the uh, nickel will plate out. Actually, it's more like a nickel 10% phosphorus alloy, which actually is a good braze alloy in and of itself. So there's electroless nickel, there's electroplated nickel. Quite often when we're trying to elect electroplate things, like if you're electroplating chromium, you'll first put down nickel on the metal, whether it's copper or s stainless steel or steel or whatever, you typically put down nickel because ni nickel just happens to have certain properties and it goes down very uniformly in electroplating. So you'll put down a nickel surface and then you plate something else on top of the nickel because nickel gives you a very nice uniform surface on, on other metals. Um, silver is, is nice uh, for brazing and things because it alloys with lots of things. It also alloys with solders. Tin is nice. Low melting, uh, a good preparation for a surface to be soldered, okay, is to pre-coat it with a tin. People sometimes use things like gold, um, and they say, well, gold would be great. Well, it turns out gold's not as good to solder to, and when we talk a little bit later here, we'll talk about why gold is not as good to solder to. And I brought in this thing, which is the Pentium that I passed around before, and um, uh, basically it has a gold back plane. Um, and so we've talked about die attach of the silicon, and they they've already put a gold they've already put a metal backplane on it, and they need that for uh, the frequencies they're operating at. You need a ground plane on the backside for the uh, high frequencies. Otherwise, you get too much capacitance, straight capacitance, and noise and other things. Um, so um, you've already got something to bond to in that case, and they use they've already seen it. They got it before class. Yep, okay. I pass it around to them before you guys were here. Um, so anyway, that's activated diffusion bonding, um, and it's actually it's not just diffusion bonding; it's soldering and brazing and other things. The other thing uh, I wanted to warn you about <coughs> is Thursday I'm going to be traveling, so you're going to see a video. The video actually is coming at just about exactly the right time. Um, there's actually several videos. Um, the video I want you to see most is. Uh, what happens in high energy density beam welding and cutting. And it's going to talk about, it's, it's going to be a lead in to what we're going to do probably next week, <coughs> beginning of next week, on fusion welding. And it'll talk about power density on the surface. For la laser electron beams, you have to have something like a million watts per square centimeter on the surface of the uh, part. And that's what lasers and electron beams can give you. They can be, be very tightly focused, put a lot of heat in a small spot. Uh, and with a million watts per square centimeter, you vaporize away the surface and you can actually drill holes. Those uh, turbine blades that I showed you that had the holes in them, typically laser drilled. Okay? But you do laser drilling at like 10 to the seventh, 10 million watts per square centimeter. You do laser welding at a million watts per square centimeter. And we'll talk about what those, why those things are. But the thing that's neat about this movie, aside from the fact that the the Japan uh, Welding Research Institute in Osaka uh, produced this in 1983 and won an international award for it. Um, and it's got a nice British accent and narration. The Japanese like, like British accents. Um, it's very, very well done. Um, and it talks about some of the principles. But one of the things they do is they laser weld on Pyrex glass. So you can see the fluid flow going on inside the, the weld as it's being made. Um, and everything's glowing, so you don't need a light. It's, it produces its own light from the heat, right? Um, 
The other thing they do is they weld on aluminum with an electron beam, and they use um, x-rays to be able to see what's happening inside the aluminum. So you'll see an x-ray radiograph movie. And one thing you need to watch in that movie is, and you may have to play it back uh, once or twice, as the, um, and it's, it's kind of faint because it's just an x-ray, and you're looking at differences, you'll have this, what they call the beam pole, and you'll see little black dots, because you're shooting through aluminum, but you'll see a little black dot right here, and then you'll see another little black dot ahead of that. And as the thing is moving, as the, the uh, part is moving in there, it turns out this is, they drilled a hole and they put a copper wire in here, a little short copper wire. Copper being much more, uh, having much higher atomic weight than, than aluminum shows up dark on the x-rays, okay, because uh, it's got triple, two and a half times the density of aluminum. And what happens is aluminum copper alloy, so when it comes, when this thing comes forward and the, the front wall of this uh, molten zone hits this, you're going to see a bunch of swirling as the copper mixes in. You're making fudge, fudge ripple ice cream, right? Okay. Uh, so you need to watch. That's going to help you see the fluid flow. It occurs very quickly, and you have to know what those dots are. It's one part of the movie they don't explain in the movie, okay? Um, but in any case. So there's a movie on that. That takes about a half an hour. And then there's a movie on inertial friction welding, so you can see some big parts. We talked about friction welding before and, and doing uh, uh, turbine discs. We talked about doing it as turbine discs, didn't we? I guess well, maybe I didn't. When we talked about friction welding, I talked about drive shafts and putting the steer knuckles on drive shafts. That was probably one of the stories I forgot. The biggest, well, not necessarily the biggest, but among the biggest friction welding parts, they actually, and friction welding is very fast and uh, process and used a lot in automotive because once you get it set right, it's, it's very reliable and you can just pop parts out very quickly. It turns out if you get it set right, it's very reliable. And they also will weld big aerospace, aerospace uh, engine compressor disc. Okay, so you got a titanium disc and another titanium disc, and each one of these might be worth thirty thousand dollars, and be in near in semi-finished machining stage. And they'll hold one of them steady. You know, the other, I mean, these things can be three feet in diameter, right? And they'll basically friction weld them together, all in about four or five seconds. Okay, or maybe ten seconds. They're a little bit bigger. And the thing is, if everything is working well, you take two $30,000 parts and you make a $70,000 part out of them. You just make $10,000 in a couple of minutes. And if things aren't working well, you take two $30,000 parts and you make scrap out of them. Okay? So um, there has been a lot of work done on friction welding, if only because of that. I guess what I talked about for aerospace was a linear friction welding and trying to weld the blades directly to the disc. But there are other applications of, uh, of friction welding. Okay, any questions on any of that? So I talked about the, uh, the video, you don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't have to worry about that. Um, and actually, well, the next week I'll be gone on Thursday and Friday. Um, and there's some other, well actually, that's when you can start watching what I call the 3371 videos. That's the ones on material selection and stuff like that. Kind of alluded to some of those things in that one, but, but uh, you can start watching those. And actually, if I, I'm going to have to miss, oh no, next week I miss Friday, only Friday. So I actually haven't missed that much. Um, uh, one day this week and one day next week. The week after that, I have to go out west, and so I'm going to miss two days, that Thursday and Friday. And frankly, we may finish up on the 18th or 19th in terms of the 25 classes. By the end of this week, we're, we're half done with the live lectures. Ta-da! It's not even the end of September, right? And we're half done. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I was just counting it up. It looks like either on the 18th or 19th we'll probably be done. And at that point, you won't have seen all the last eight or nine of those 3371 videos, but you don't have to come early in the morning unless you want to. We can talk about whether whether you do that, but, you know, if you want, just, you know, if you want to keep getting breakfast, then you, know, <laughs> you can come. <laughs> anyway, you can also watch those things at home, okay, if you've got a DVD player. Or you can watch them off the web. Okay, now I want to talk about soldering. Um, and we've talked a little bit about soldering and, and things before, but this comes out of the soldering handbook, the old soldering, actually I guess it is the only soldering handbook in the American Welding Society right now. 
and you've got this in your in your handout as so far as that goes. But uh, let me brighten that up a little. Okay. And they they're talking about soldering with a soldering iron here, but I just use it because it shows the complexity of the process. You've got a heat source up here. Now that heat source doesn't have to be a, an iron soldering iron, um, and they are actually made out of iron, and then they're copper plated. Uh, because the flux isn't going to wet the iron very well as it oxidizes. Let's say you copper plate the surface and then you get the flux on there and then it's pre-tinned with the flux, not, not the flux, but the solder. Uh, so you have molten solder here. You have solidified solder as you're pulling, the, they're showing this heat source being pulled along in that direction. Uh, so you're leaving behind solder here, but you have an oxide or contamination on the surface, but you also have a flux here. So you got Fairly, and then you got the substrate. Okay, so you got a fairly complex system, and soldering is a complex process. It's been around for thousands of years, but it turns out that it's a fairly complex process. Um, the key thing in soldering is control of the surface tension, and I've shown you before. Good old Young's, or I talked about Young, good old Young's equation. Young's equation essentially looks at surface te tension, so I've got a vapor, a liquid, and a solid. And if I take, I balance forces around here, I can write a vector that stands for the gamma, in this case, of the solid vapor, and the surface tension pulling back here is gamma of the liquid solid, and here I'll have a surface tension that represents gamma of the liquid vapor. So whatever the two phases on either side of these things, I guess I could get a little fancier and since I got colored chalk here and give you colored vectors on here. But typically that's what people like to write down. This is in the Young's equation, which I showed you once before. You just resolve the forces in the horizontal direction. So the ones heading right or to your left, my right, gamma solid vapor equals gamma liquid solid heading in the other, other direction, plus gamma liquid vapor cosine theta, and this is theta, and theta is called the wetting angle. And this whole thing is called Young's equation. Anything that talks about surface tension in the first couple of things is going to, we talked about this in the adhesive bonding, okay? It's going to put down Young's equation. A couple of things about one's equa Young's equation. It only applies at equilibrium. Okay, it's a static balance of forces. If this thing is strong enough, it'll just keep pulling this thing all the way and the thing will completely spread out and completely wet the surface. Okay, and that's what you do when you add these things to your, dish your dishwashing detergent that helps the water sheet off the glasses. You're actually putting some contamination in there so that uh, uh, this, the water will sheet off the glasses. If you get them really, really clean um, and don't have this little surfactant in there, um, surfactant just puts a little model layer of low surface energy stuff on there so that the water kind of flows off. If you get high surface energy, like when you wax your car, you get everything beat up. Okay? So, you need something to, uh, you can control the surface energy with small amounts of, of things. In the case of uh, soldering, you want the liquid metal to flow across the surface. And in fact, you've got a liquid metal here and you've got a solid metal here. And they like, they have similar, they have metallic, both have metallic bonding. You've got a flux up here rather than a vapor. And so you can call this liquid flux rather than liquid vapor. Although in soldering you can use hydrogen and other things, so you could have a vapor as the thing that reduces your oxide. And you want this thing to, to pull everything across so that you get a nice low value of, of theta, okay, uh, to allow the solder to flow, flow and completely wet the surface. And if you get the surface clean and this stuff flows, you have a true metal-metal bonding. There is no surface contamination. Uh, it's not like adhesive bonding. Adhesive bonding, I had to have a low surface energy adhesive that would, would satisfy the bonds and flow across the surface. Here I actually clean that metal surface. Metal surfaces have high surface energies to begin with, and another metal is going to go and flow across there quite well if I, uh, if I can clean the surface. So cleaning it is one of the most important things that you can do. 
and we're going to talk a fair amount about about cleaning it. Now, a little bit later, like on tomorrow or Friday, we'll start talking about brazing. Anybody know the difference between brazing and soldering? Temperature, Temperature exactly. It turns out that if you, this is a handy dandy little pot out of, well, I can't remember, it may have come out of Manco, but anyway. Um, so, I mean, it's a, a Xerox out of it, but, but, uh, oops, go down a little bit. Where they plot the temperature of solders and brazes, it turns out, according to the American Welding Society, the difference between soldering and brazing is soldering occurs below 800 degrees Fahrenheit and brazing occurs above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. If the International Institute of Welding, the critical temperature is 425. Well, it turns out if you convert to Celsius, 800 and 425 are very close. They're within 20 degrees Fahrenheit of each other. So it's just one of them does it in Celsius and one of them does it in Fahrenheit. But it turns out the reason I like to put this thing up is <coughs> how do they come up with this definition? Well, it turns out there's certain metal systems like you can have bismuth-based alloys or indium-based alloys or tin silver alloys or tin lead alloys or lead silver. Tin lead alloy is what we know most commonly. That's the lead tin solder is the, the most common eutectic 60-40, 60 40, 60 40 tin uh, or 60% 60 tin and 40% lead. Cadmium zinc, they're, these are basically low melting alloys. And then you get up here to aluminum silicon alloys and silver-based alloys. There is a no man's land in here, around just above, right around 800 degrees Fahrenheit or 425C. There are not metal alloys that melt in that range. They just, there's no, I mean, there's not, you know, there might be something in the rare earth elements, europium or something, I don't know. But in terms of anything that's affordable or that you would want to use, um, there's just no metal alloys. Just nature didn't give us metals that melt in that range. So there is sort of a real difference in what you're allowed to, what you're, you have available to use. And in fact, this book on soldering plots everything in two plots. This is solder alloy family, okay? And they go from gallium. Gallium is a metal that melts in your hand, not in your mouth. Actually, it's toxic like lead, so or like uh, lead and mercury, so you don't really want to eat it. But uh, gallium melts at like 18 or 19 degrees centigrade, which is like 68, or, no, 20 degrees centigrade is 68, isn't it? Something like that. Anyway, Fahrenheit. So they basically, it will melt in your hand, literally. Okay. Bismuth alloys, indium, indium, tin, lead based. And of course, there's tin lead based. So, and then there are some gold silicon, gold germanium, and gold tin. These are eutectics of gold that form very, very low temperatures. But you'll see this plot goes up to 400 degrees centigrade and just a little above 700 F. And there's no alloys that straddle the top of that thing. And then I come over here to the braze alloy families. And they start at 500 degrees centigrade or 1,000 degrees F. There's, what happened to 700 to 1,000? There's nothing there. That's why they've done it, okay? And so we've got aluminum-based brazes, silver solders. Silver, we always call them silver solders, but they're brazes. They're silver brazes, technically, okay? Gold, copper, nickel, palladium, platinum. You can keep on going up to even higher temperatures if you want. I mean, people do platinum brazing of graphite, for example. Um, I told you that platinum, I think I told you the other day, that platinum will dissolve a little bit of carbon. Well, it turns out you can braise graphite with platinum, and you can do it at 1,700 degrees centigrade. So you can make braise joints out of uh, with platinum um, on graphite that you're making the braise joint at a higher temperature than melting temperature steel or nickel or super alloys. Now, it doesn't work very well in an oxidizing environment. I mean, the platinum does just fine, but the graphite kind of oxidizes away. But there are cases where people in a reducing environment need a very high temperature material and they want to use graphite. You can also braze ceramics at some very high temperatures. The problem with ceramics when you're brazing is, remember this, 300 degrees centigrade is all you need to get yield level stresses. Ceramics don't do well with yield level stresses. So I can braze ceramics, and we'll talk a little bit about brazing ceramics. But the point of all this is 
soldering is below 800 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a low temperature process, and there are certain consequences to that. Um, if I one, uh, so I told you the two things about Young's equation. One is that it it applies at equilibrium. If I haven't got equilibrium, or if gamma solid vapor is big enough, it can overpower both of these. I mean, if gamma solid vapor is greater than the sum of these two, then my contact angle has to go to zero, and I just wet the, wet the whole surface. And I'd like to get something like that for a soldering or an adhesive bonding operation. The other problem with the Young's equation is the longer you think about it, the less sense it makes. It's one of these things that you can write it down, you can derive it very quickly, and it says, oh, that's just equal balance of forces, you know, uh, surface tension forces. But if you actually get in and start studying surface tension, and you start thinking very hard about things, you find that Young's equation in the long run really doesn't make much sense. For example, if I had a sphere of a solid, and I had a liquid wetting that sphere, Young's equation would say you could define that angle, right? No, mathematically you can't. If you try to solve that problem, mathematicians still struggle with this problem. Okay? Can't be solved as a unique mathematical solution. And all you've done is change the geometry, right? So where the, I mean, what happened to the physics? If this really has some true physics, okay, what why can't you just change the geometry and solve it and get a unique solution? Well, it turns out that's still a a problem that's struggled by struggled with by uh, by physicists and mathematicians of how to explain what you get when you wet curved surfaces <laughs> as opposed to flat surfaces. So, well, if it doesn't even work for a curved surface, what good is it, right? Well, conceptually, it helps us kind of keep these these different parameters in our mind, and we can talk about wetting angles and stuff. But the other problem is Young's equation is a function of all kinds of things, why, that's why it doesn't quite make sense. It turns out, if I have a very rough surface, which I know that on a microscopic scale I do have a very rough surface, well, what does Young's equation mean now? Does it, what's the contact angle on a rough surface? In fact, if I were to take a piece of metal, this is a small piece of metal, and I sand it such that the sanding marks are all running in this direction. And I try to apply, uh, I just put some solder on a piece of sand, rough sanded copper, and I try to do a wetting test, the typical wetting test on a smooth piece of copper. If I put a little ball of solder here, it will spread out in sort of a circle. If I do it on this, it turns out I'll get an ellipse. Well, why? Well, that's sort of, actually it turns out to be sort of obvious. If I'm going, if I'm spreading in the direction of the bumps, I have more contact area between the two, and that greater contact angle area means that now I have different areas. I have to put area ratios in here because spreading in the direction of the, uh, the grooves gives me more area that I'm going to eliminate or satisfy the surface bonds than if I'm spreading across the grooves. So it turns out surface roughness can enhance the wetting. So Young's equation doesn't say anything about surface roughness. Okay? It's just a static balance. Um, so it turns out Young's equation is something we can write down, and it's a, kind of a useful concept. But if you ever try to apply it, you probably don't have enough information to apply it. In fact, there's something in your notes, they call it the roughness factor. And they say that the wetting angle is the cosine of theta prime over cosine of theta. And theta is what you get out of Young's equation, but theta prime is the actual measured wetting angle. And R is the roughness factor. The higher the roughness, the more torturous, the more surface area you have created by roughness, the, um, um, the lower the contact angle as the cosine you know, of theta goes to 1 as, as theta goes to 0, right? Um, so um, when sometimes if you're having a little bit of problem, and I've done this once or twice, getting something to wet, if you roughen up the surface, you can get it to flow. Well, Young's equation doesn't tell you any of those physics, okay? 
There's also a problem with hysteresis of the contact angle. And the hysteresis of the, whoop, I guess I erased my other thing. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> if I have a, a rough surface and I actually get the liquid to flow, and then for some reason I remove the liquid, and there's different ways to, to do that, I will often leave a little bit of my original material down in the valleys of this rough surface such that if it, flow, if it flows in as a wave and it flows back and then it flows back in, Young's equation changes because the surface energy changes. I'm not wetting the same thing I was before that had a high surface energy. I'm wetting with the same thing I came in with, which has a lower surface energy than this. That's why it wetted it. And now I have my valleys filled with something of low surface energy. That means the contact angle to re-wet is going to be higher. It's going to be harder to re-wet something that's already been wetted because I've left behind this lower energy material down in the valleys. So it turns out there's lots of complications to trying to understand uh, these things uh, if you really try to get quantitative on it. And we're going to find that soldering is not the most quantitative of sciences. In fact, maybe it's not a science at all. Um, it's very, very difficult to there's a lot of descriptive nature to, uh, to uh, soldering, and there's not a lot of mathematics that you can apply to these things, in part because the, the little plot I put up there the very first, the very beginning, it's a complex process. Okay, I've got, you know, I've got lots of things going on, lots of phases. If I start adding geometric or surface roughness, uh, uh, changes or hysteresis of things. I just complicate things <laughs> in my ability to uh, to be quantitative about soldering uh, degrades rapidly. But let's talk about the requirements of a flux. Since I can't be very quantitative, let's be descriptive. The flux is what's going to clean the contamination off the surface. The surface roughness is going to be taken care of because I'm going to interpose the liquid between the surfaces I want to join, right? Same old theme of get rid of the contamination, find some way to take care of the surface roughness. In this case, put a liquid in there. So the flux is the thing that gets rid of the contamination in soldering. And it has to have, according to one reference, Manco, actually it's a couple of references, it has to have, actually let's see which one I want to use. Yeah, I guess I'll use this one. Um, Chemical activity it's got to have enough power to clean off that surface film. It has to have spreading activity, and we'll talk about I'll give you examples of what they mean by these. And really this this is a can it dissolve the surface oxide? This is sort of does it have the right kind of surface surface energy so that it can spread across the surface? Will it give you a low enough value of theta? Um, it has to have thermal stability. And the fourth thing it must should be non-corrosive. Okay. So what are the examples of these things? Um, one example, Manco gives this. Manco is a book that you've got references on um, in your handout. But Manco talks about, gives us specific examples. If I use oxalic acid as the flux, oxalic acid is an organic acid. Uh, it's found in a number of plants, particularly oxalic. Oxalis, which is a weed that grows in my garden, okay, um, it's very high in this particularly. I can't remember if oxalic is eight or twelve carbons in the chain, but it's basically like a stearate or a, I mean, there's oxalic acid like formic acid or acetic acid. Formic is one carbon in the chain. Acetic is two. Lactic is three. Lactic is found in milk, okay, when milk sours. Um, Anyway, you keep on going up the number of chains of carbons, and oxalic is one of these things, okay? Oleic acid, found in butter, 
Okay? I can't remember. I mean, if you look in the dictionary under these, you know, you'll find a list of these things. Um, if you look in a chemistry, organic chemistry book, it'll tell you what these different things are. Because a certain number of, certain plants and animals produce certain types of, of things. Stearates, stearates, we talked about stearates as the lubricant. And stearates have like 20 carbons in the chain. So oxalic is just another, another hydrocarbon. Uh, carbox, carboxylic acid. Um, as far as that goes. So oxalic acid, if I, if I have some copper with copper oxide tarnish on it and I want to flow some lead tin solder and I use oxalic acid as the thing to reduce the oxide and I, so I put, put it on a hot plate or whatever, I start heating everything up, I will see as things, as I start to melt the lead tin, it will start to flow and it will you know, start to wet the surface and then all of a sudden it will stop. And the problem is oxalic acid has no thermal stability. Oxalic acid evaporates at 182 degrees C and lead tin eutectic melts at 183. So the problem with oxalic acid, it actually has enough ability to remove the copper oxide. Okay, it's an acid and it will reduce copper oxide. And it has the right type of surface tension properties in this whole Young's equation thing but it doesn't have thermal stability, it won't stay in place. Another thing I could use is glucose. Turns out sugars can be used as fluxes. You could try sucrose, but sucrose you kind of end up with caramel. <laughs> okay, if you heat up sucrose, you just caramelize it, right? Um, but if you use glucose, um, you will find that you can you can melt the lead tin and you can have this kind of somewhat viscous sugar on there and you can actually take that little ball of solder and you can move it around the copper plate and when you're all done you can dissolve away the sugar in water and you look at what you've got and it's like a little slug left a trail of solder all over the thing. Why? Because glucose ends up forming a lousy contact angle. The contact angle of lead tin on copper here's your lead tin, is very, very high. It doesn't have the right Young's equation. It doesn't have the right spreading activity. And so as a result, it, will, it has the right chemical activity. It can remove the copper oxide, and it's thermally stable. But it ends up leaving a little, it doesn't have the right ability to spread by Young's equation, the wrong surface tension balance here. And so the little area that does contact will wet and just kind of move around the surface, but you're, you're screwed in the long run, okay? Uh, so far as that goes, uh, you don't end up getting good wetting. And the last thing that he gives an example of, uh, yeah, I think it's EI, let me see. There's an I before E here. It is I before E. Abetic acid, okay? In the case of abetic acid, which is another, it's a more complex, it's got a bunch of rings and stuff on it, but the abetic acid uh, as a flux for the lead tin solder, the, it'll kind of ball up similar to this, but if you then put a very, very small drop of hydrochloric acid with it, all of a sudden everything spreads out. And the problem here is abetic acid by itself is not very good in chemical activity. It has right surface tension balance, has thermal stability, but it doesn't have enough ability to dissolve the copper oxide unless the copper oxide is very, very thin. So abetic acid can only dissolve a little bit of copper oxide. Well. Anybody know what abetic acid uh, commonly is found in? Rosin flux for soldering. It turns out that uh, rosin flux, abetic acid, is found in the, in the sap of pine trees. We call it rosin flux. Anybody ever had rosin baked potatoes? Not good old Georgia crackers, okay? I grew up in Georgia. My next door neighbor, we barbecue something outdoors in the summer. He had a pot of rosin and he would put it on the grill. He would melt the rosin 
and then you'd wrap your, you clean your baked potatoes, you wrap them in aluminum foil, and you throw them in this pot of molten rosin. And it just made a baked potato that had a fantastic texture. Because basically you steamed the baked potato and kept all the moisture in. You didn't lose moisture out because it was inside the baked potato. But, uh, and you, as long as the aluminum foil was tight, it didn't taste like rosin. <laughs> if it wasn't tight, <laughs> you had to learn to seal that aluminum foil well. But anyway, um, you get a different texture to your baked potato if you do it that way. Um, anyway, so rosin has a betic acid. It's an organic acid. It's a very complex molecule. I could draw it for you if you're really interested. But, but um, it, does, it will dissolve a little bit of copper oxide, but not a lot. So if I have freshly cleaned copper, I can get a, uh, uh, a good situation for, I think I've got a plot. That's not the right one. Remember which book this is in. Um, here we go. Um, tarnishes build up over time. So this is, let me try to focus that. I'm not sure it's focused as well as it should be. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, this is oxide growth on four base metals at room temperature as a function of time. It's out of a book on soldering, right? So the oxide thickness in nanometers, so if we're talking angstroms, this is 100 angstroms. This is 50 angstroms. This time is in minutes. If I freshly clean some metal in some acid bath or something that will get rid of the tarnish on the metal, I have about five minutes before I end up regrowing that oxide on copper to something like, pardon me? Whoops. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? I lent, I lent, oh. I hit the wrong, what did I do? Oh. oh, I know what I did. Now I zoomed out. Oh, I'm way zoomed in now. Pretty powerful zoom, huh? All right. Anyway, but I also, I leaned, you're right, I leaned on the controls. Don't lean on the controls, you moron. Oh, sorry, that's me. Um, okay, um, the problem is that copper, let me open that up and lighten it again. Um, copper and all other metals will just form their oxides within minutes. And it might steady, it, it tends to form uh, kind of, it continues to grow over time, but it grows slowly over time. So this only goes up to less than two hours. This thing actually does, over 24 hours, keep, keep going up. Um, it turns out that, well, we could go through other cleaning things, but there actually are some good things in my old handout. If I look at Where you go? Where you go? One of these guys. Here we go. This is in your handout somewhere. But So this is wetting time in seconds. You can barely see the little S there. Um, and this is freshly cleaned copper. This was within a couple of minutes. And this is the amount of chlorine. And this is the amount of time. It takes less, it takes less, it takes about a half a second in freshly cleaned abetic acid to get good wetting. And if I add a little bit of chlorine, well, it turns out the HCl, all it does is helps the abetic acid to remove the copper oxide tarnish. And you can see the effect here. If I want to store this copper at, for one hour at 150 degrees centigrade and oxidize it to a little bit or two hours, it takes more and more chlorine to get this stuff to wet within a reasonable amount of time to get it to flow. And the point of all of this is 
Not only is cleanliness next to godliness, but clean, the time between cleaning is um, critical if I'm trying to so- solder things. It turns out, if I'm trying to do a big printed circuit board, I need to have my cleaning operation right before my soldering operation. If I let it sit aside on a rack for 10 minutes, I've screwed things up. And I can use a betic acid, pure, what we call water white rosin. Water white means that if you melt the rosin and drop it in in, uh, water and let it solidify, kind of crystallizes it as a white uh, rosin, as opposed to the stuff that came from the tree sap and wasn't distilled and has a bunch of plant particles and insects and bodies and things like that in it, right? So it won't be white if it's got old old roach shells or something or termite shells or something. Um, in any case, the problem we have is that if you got you got two two problems here, you can either do things quickly and use um, pure rosin, which will has enough chemical activity to get rid of a very thin tarnish layer. Or you can add a, bit, a little bit of chlorine, and the chlorine can be as hydrochloric acid, it can be as uh, amine hydrochloride, which is basically cough medicine, okay? Uh, it's a good amine hydrochloride, if you read the facts of cough medicine. Anyway, it can be amines are just nitrogen, you know, ammonia type compounds. These things will help clean the surface and allow you to let the stuff sit out for a longer period of time, but the problem is they end up leading to corrosion, okay? And it turns out for <coughs> many, many situations, and we'll talk about the corrosion in a second, you're not allowed or you're, you're um, to have, yeah, i to find this other one now, um, chlorines, chlorides in your flux. And so there actually is a, this is classification from the international ISO, Okay, the International Standards Organization for um, different types of uh, fluxes. And resin, they call it resin type, but it actually is rosin. Okay, some people call it resin. Well, it's the resin that comes from pine trees, which is called rosin. Okay, um, so the flux, flux basis, well, I'm sorry, I take it back. One is rosin, which is the naturally occurring resin from the pine tree, and then there's a synthetic resin that you can make, um, which you can make from you know, a chemical plant. Um, and the flux can be non-activated. It can have halogen activated. It doesn't have to be chlorine. It can be bromine or iodine, but typically it's chlorine. Or not halogen activated, which means it may have some ammonia compounds and other things uh, in there. Um, there's organic water soluble, non water soluble, inorganic salts that have ammonium chloride, okay, which is a good thing. Phosphoric acid, Coca Cola, okay. You all know Coca Cola is basically phosphoric acid, right? Um, ammonia or other amines. So these are flux types A, B, and C in the international standardization. Uh, we call them, I think, in my that's the ISO stuff in the old days. I used to have them listed as, well, we just call them activated, non-activated, mildly activated, or um, activated. Is this chart, you can barely read the stuff up there. But it talks about different things that I can solder to, and whether I can use a non-activated flux. Well, things that have no particular surface oxide, platinum, gold, copper, silver, cadmium, plate, Tin, remember I said at the very beginning here today, I didn't erase it, I've erased it, that you can activate the surface, and for soldering, a lot of times you like to put tin, either hot dipped or tin plated, or solder plate, where you basically put a lead tin on the surface. You can use a non activated flux, it's easy to solder. If I go to other things, lead oxide is somewhat stable, nickel plate is, uh, needs a, a chloride to clean off the, the uh, oxide. There's lots of different brasses and bronzes, and so they kind of put them in here. Rhodium is a, uh, a precious metal, but it, it tends to form a little bit of an oxide. Brilliant copper, you need you can solder these things, but you need a, a fairly aggressive flux that has a fair amount of hydrochloric acid. And then they talk about some other things. But you get down here, there are certain things that we're going to get to in a little bit. Um, 
Aluminum says requires pre-coating for electronic applications, and beryllium and titanium, no one has ever filled out a, figured out a flux. The oxides in beryllium and titanium are so stable that no one's ever been able to figure out a flux that would reduce them at a temperature of less than 800 degrees Fahrenheit, or 425 degrees C. I don't have enough temperature to give me a nice aggressive flux. When we get to brazing, we're going to find above those temperatures, you can almost always find a flux that's aggressive enough when you got extra temperature. But soldering, if you can come up with a solder for titanium, uh, you can make some people very happy, namely the guy that does my, uh, my eyeglass frames. People like to use titanium for the eyeglass frames. He likes to use soldering or silver brazing to repair them. Can't do it with titanium. Okay, with titanium oxide is too stable. That's not to say you can't braze titanium. It brazes beautifully, but you can't solder to it. So it has to do with whether you can clean that clean that surface. Yep. Well, typically on stainless steel, you may you might nickel plate it. And then you can basically, it makes it easier, okay? Uh, you could copper plate it, or you could pre-tin it, okay? You can go to a higher temperature uh, and use a more aggressive flux. And then if you want to solder to it, you, you essentially uh, do something with it that way. Um, typically, stainless steel is cleaned in hydrochloric acid. And if I freshly clean the stainless steel in hydrochloric acid, I can solder it to it. But freshly cleaned means within the last few minutes, right? within the last 10 minutes. And I remember uh, uh, a number of years ago, I was, uh, I had a number of years ago, yeah, it's fit, almost 15 now, in the leadership manufacturing program, in the first group of students, I had a, uh, some students that were working on the, uh, with a company supplying uh, these tab tapes that we talked about before for semiconductor chips to Digital Equipment Corporation, this is when they existed 15 years ago, and they were trying to get into the mainframe computer business. And the tab tapes that this company was work at making was right down the street from uh, uh, where Motorola was making the chips that went, were going to go into this mainframe computer that they'd sell for 4 or 5 or $10 million or whatever and compete with IBM. At that time, IBM's mainframe computer business, this is 1988 or 89, was a $40 billion a year business, and they had kind of a a monopoly in the world on mainframe computers. Well, what happened is PCs got more and more powerful. You learned to link them together. No one needs a mainframe anymore, except, you know, a few applications where people need supercomputers. Well, in any case, they ha they made these tab tapes, and to make these tab tapes, you start with a a film, a polyester film, and it's metallized with copper, and then you put gold down, and you take gold off, and you etch, and you put photoresist on. You basically make these tab tapes the same way you make semiconductors, just on a little bit larger scale. There were 200 operations in making that tab tape, which is why these things cost $50 a piece, just for the, the little tab tape. Um, but they would do this, and the first thing I learned was they would make the interlead bonds right there in Arizona, just down the street from where they made the tab tape. Now, they wouldn't do it within minutes, but they might do it within a couple of days. They'd make the bonds to the chip. And then they would ship this part to Cupertino, California, and a month later, they would make the outer lead bonds, which were basically solder bonds. By that point, they had gold and they had lead and tin and everything else on here. And they were trying to do this without any flux. And certainly not with any chlorides, and we'll talk tomorrow about why you want to keep the chlorides out. But, and I thought, this is not going to work. You're not going to get any reliability of the bonding. And guess what? They couldn't get any reliability of the bonding. But then it got worse, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow. I, uh, I found out that when they were doing the plating to make the, uh, the copper, put the copper down and things, um, <coughs> they were doing some of the plating in sulfamate baths. Well, it turns out we're going to learn tomorrow that sulfur is one of the biggest contaminants you can have. If I start getting copper, and it doesn't have just copper oxide on the surface, but copper sulfide, the copper sulfide is so much more stable, the fluxes don't work, even if you had a flux. It turns out seven parts per million sulfur will contaminate the, the, uh, le the copper sufficiently that you usually can't solder to it. So not only were they waiting 30 days rather than three minutes, okay, 
but they also were using sulfur around there. And lo and behold, we learned over time that they couldn't do it. That, that was one of the big bottlenecks. They had other problems with the VAX 9000. Uh, and I think they made like five or six VAX 9000s finally. And it was the couple of billion dollars that digital equipment spent on the VAX 9000 that essentially allowed them to go bankrupt or get sold off to, get sold to Dell or whoever. But uh, uh, they spent, I think they budgeted at $1 billion and they came in at 2 or $3 billion finally to make the VAX 9000 and they only produced about five or 10 of them. They gave one of them to MIT because no one else would buy them. <laughs> okay, so they donated one to MIT. So we had one for a while, for whatever that was worth. Okay, I'll talk to you tomorrow.